three talks were designed to complement riches of the earth. Uh, we had three speakers. The first one talked about the geopolitical risk for countries without access to rare earth minerals. And the second speaker uh, spoke about mining sustainably the rare earth minerals. And tonight, we're very fortunate to have Ruth Siddell of the University College of London, who's going to talk to us about the history of pigments and the cultural importance of minerals. So can we please welcome Ruth Siddell? Thank you. Right, hopefully I'm in the right place. Is that working? You can never hear when you're on this side of the microphone. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I've just noticed that if the Zoom camera is what people can see here, they can only see me from here up. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're getting a lot of wall and just the top of my head. No. Oh, I've gone completely now, by the way, a bit more, a bit more, a bit more. That's it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know if you get to see the, the screen as well on Zoom, but I hope you do. So thank you once again to Betty and the BRLSI for inviting me to speak tonight. Great honour. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk to you about mineral pigments in archaeology. Uh, and as Betty said, my name's Ruth, um, and I'm I'm a geologist by background, and particularly a petrologist, so somebody who looks at what rocks and minerals are made of. And I've been working on pigments for oh well over twenty years now, um, and uh, I got into the study of pigments through, of course, my interest in minerals. And, uh, you know, so mineral pigments were my, my gateway pigments. But um, as time has gone on, I've, you know, become quite knowledgeable as well about other types of pigments. So not just mineral pigments, but that is what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. OK, so what are pigments? So I'm talking about pigments in terms of artists pigments here rather than for example melanin which will pigment the skin or carotenoids in in tomatoes or whatever so specifically artist pigments um so the definition of a pigment is it's the coloring component of a paint but a paint as we'll see is a much more complicated material in its own right and pigments can be animal vegetable or mineral um, so from natural minerals, which is what I'm going to talk about this evening, but also from natural plant dyes, things like indigo, weld, madder, so on and so forth. And, you know, from, well, from the, the end of the 18th century, um, there's been huge synthetic manufacture of pigments as well. And in fact, you know, one might think, you know, the earliest synthetic pigment was, was developed in the Paleolithic when people discovered that they could burn yellow ochre and turn it red. So there's always been a lot of innovation in synthesizing pigments from, from antiquity to the present day. So the property for something to work as a pigment is it must be able to retain its color when it's very finely ground. And hopefully you've all seen the ex exhibition downstairs uh, and there are a whole variety of colored minerals and rocks, but not all of those have this property. So this is a specific property that only some minerals demonstrate. And, uh, and I put solid, it needs to be a solid material, it needs to be non-soluble in water, but also non-soluble in other media like linseed oil, poppy oil, uh, acrylic, all the various media that paints come in. Right, see if I can get the action. Yes. <laughs> so just to summarize the kind of range of pigments available, um, natural pigments include mineral pigments, uh, which include earth pigments, which I'll talk about tonight, but also, as I mentioned, uh, natural dyes and direct dyes and vat dyes produce uh, a solid colored material. Remember, pigments have to be solid. Uh, mordant dyes are soluble in water, so we have to make what is called a lake pigment um, by attaching 
the dye molecule to an inorganic mole molecule, usually aluminium hydroxide through a chemical reaction. But if you want to talk on dye pigments, that will have to be another time. I'm not going to talk about them anymore this evening. So mineral pigments. Um, to get a pigment, a mineral that is suitable as a pigment, say it has to retain its color when it's very finely ground. And, you know, archeologically, um, typically your particle size is going to be something like 30, 40 microns. And a micron is a millionth of a meter. So just put that in context. We're talking something that has the, the texture of really fine grained baking flour, that kind of particle size. So not sands or anything like that, really finely powdered material. Uh, so in petrology, in the, the study of minerals, um, in earth sciences, we, we talk about crystals, minerals that have a strong body color. And that means that when we look at them in the routine way that we do look at rocks, which is a thin slice of a rock in thin section under the microscope, it's colored rather than transparent. And the majority of minerals are transparent when you look at them in thin sections. So it's the one with the, the strong body colors that are important. They also need to be soft and easy to grind down. If you're going to get them down to this fine powder, you don't want to be battling too hard and you don't want to produce a really gritty substance that's gonna tear your paper or whatever when you paint on it. Um, so something that is relatively soft and friable, breaks down easily, is also important. And from the, those of you that do know anything about mineralogy, uh, any mineral that perfor performs well in the street test will usually work. Um, and that should say, or strongly colored in thin section has pigment potential. A street test is um, a form of, um, well, it's, it's the way you assay minerals in the way that you assay gold and silver. So back in the day, the quality of gold and silver was tested by scratching it on touchstone, which is a piece of black slate or black marble, and you'll get a mark. And if you were experienced, you could estimate, A, whether it's real silver or real gold, and also the, the quality of that material. It's the same technique here, where you scratch the mineral on a piece of black slate or these days quite often on a piece of unglazed porcelain and you'll get a colored line or not as the case may be. Um, but it's the ones that leave the colored line which are softest and strongest, strongest colored which are suitable as pigments. And they don't tend to be silicate minerals. And again, if you know about geology, you'll know that by far and away, the, ma the vast majority of minerals present on our planet are silicates. And there is one huge ex exception that breaks this rule, but otherwise silicate minerals do not make good pigments. So we're looking for things that are oxides, sulfides, carbonates, phosphates, which are a much ignored group of mineral and, and various salt related minerals. And I don't mean salt as in table salt there, uh, I mean salt as in the chemical meaning of that <laughs> word. And then you need to make a paint. Um, and so that means that you mix the pigment with a medium. And that could be gum arabic, which is the, the medium that is used for watercolor painting. It could be oil, something like linseed oil, for example, which is used for oil painting. Not any old oil will do. You need something that is going to dry eventually. Uh, so if you tried, you know, if you made a paint with olive oil, you'd make a fantastic paint but your painting will never, ever, ever dry. So, you know, you need certain oils to use. So linseed oil, poppy oil, walnut oil. Um, you can also paint using the tempera technique, which uses egg yolk as a medium. And you might think, well, that's a bit brightly colored in its own right, but it, it dries transparent and doesn't affect the color of the pigment. And then there are uh, beeswax, which is the encaustic technique. So various, and all of these, notice they're all organic compounds chemically. They're all derived from plants or animals. And there are many, many others as well, like casein, which is a protein extracted from milk. How people discovered these things, I will never know, but they do. So casein gives you distemper. Um, the, the important thing about all of these things is they dry and they stick, not only the pigment grains to each other, but they stick them to the substrate. 
So yeah, you can make a, a paint uh, such as a cosmetic from water. It'll be fine, but once it dries, all the pigment will just fall off and you don't want that in a painting. You might want it in a cosmetic when you want to wash it up, wash it off at the end of the day. Then you can add other materials to paint. So things like um, fillers, which bulk out the paint and, you know, starch is a really common filler. Uh, and then you can add vehicles as well, which, which ease the flow of, play, of paints. Um, so oxgall liquid, which is exactly what it says on the tin, um, can be added. And that, you know, for example, will make your watercolour um, flow even better than it already does. And you can use, of course, thinning oils as well in um, oil painting um, to, to change the consistency of your paint. So quite complicated materials and modern paints are very complicated materials. So let's talk about mineral pigments, and I'm going to start with the most famous of all, probably, which are the ochres. Now, the word ochre to geologists means any metal oxide or oxide hydroxide rich compound. Um, and it can contain other things. And so um, ochres can be, and 90% and of them are, iron oxides, but you can get other ochres, you can get cobalt ochres, you can get nickel ochres, you get silver ochres. Um, so there are many other ochres that you can get, but normally, and particularly in a painting compound co context, we talk about ochres as being iron rich oxides or oxide hydroxides, but they are impure materials. So there's going to be other stuff in there dirt basically um, and particularly for the iron oxides these are sulfate compounds or sulfide compounds um, like pyrite and other minerals that are there in the mix like quartz calcite which are common um, rock forming minerals on on earth and they can form in secondary it's primary environments so that true ochres if you like primary ochres form directly on top of an ore body and then we can get secondary ochres, which form in the sedimentary environment, which means they've been eroded, transported and redeposited somewhere else. Uh, as soils, for example, as ironstones. Uh, Gossen is the name for um, the kind of enriched ochreous zone above an ore deposit. It's an old, old German name. Um, and as I say, these are not silicates. They've got iron in them. Iron is a very strong colouring element. A lot of the transition elements in the periodic table will promote colour. And the other great thing about ochres is that the iron oxides and iron oxide hydroxide minerals are the smallest crystal size apart from the clay minerals. So we know that they will keep their colour when very finely ground. And I kind of hate and love analysing ochres um, because, you know, if it's red or orange or yellow, it probably always is an ochre, but the particle size is so, so small, it's very difficult to see anything. Uh, and I will talk about how I analyse pigments in a, in a bit. Um, but here, this is a really lovely poster from uh, Windsor & Newton on an adver advertisement from the 1930s. Uh, and as it says, you know, from beneath the ruins of ancient Pompeii, yellow ochre, I'm sure that Windsor and Newton were not getting their um, ochre from beneath the ruins of ancient Pompeii. Uh, Windsor and Newton are a paint manufacturing company, by the way, if you haven't heard of them, still going today. And um, but, you know, they were sourcing this material and still do source this material as the natural mineral, although we can synthesize these compounds as well these days. Um, so yeah, yellow ochre to red ochre. Actually, this image is a little bit dulled out. This is much more of a cherry red uh, in, in reality than, it, than it's being projected on the screen. We can get this real range of colors from very pale lemon yellows through to darker reds. And um, this is a classification of ochres and umbers, you know, again, we think of umber, if you've done any painting, you'll know as umber as a, a paint term, a colour term, but we also think of umbers in a geological sense as well. Um, and, you know, they're all very much of a muchness. Sienna 
is which can be spelled either with two or one n um, is another example so this is a, a classification of how we use these terms within the context of pigments um, so ochres are pigments that are dominantly iron oxide and iron oxide hydroxide rich earths and by an earth i mean exactly that something that's quite friable soil like material but there's no organic matter in it no worms um, and the, the main components, there are about 15 or so iron oxide or iron oxide hydroxide minerals, but the main components of red ochre is the mineral hematite, uh, Fe2O3, and gertite, which is yellow ochre, um, which is FeOOH2. Uh, ferrihydrite is, I'll, well, actually, I'll come to ferrihydrite in a minute. Uh, and jarosite, which I'm not going to talk about in any detail, is um, a sulfate rich uh, iron ochre. And, and it's the most ignored group of um, yellow ochre pigments that there are. It's quite hard to analyze, it's quite hard to identify, but it gives you this beautiful pale lemon yellow colored color and it was used very very regularly in painting in the Roman period and, and in ancient, ancient Egyptian throughout the Eastern Mediterranean in fact. Um, then we can have black manganese oxides added in various amounts. So we're increasing manganese oxide as we go through this scheme. So siennas, well, this is a very, very broadly used term. It originally applied to particular earth pigments that were dug around the town of Siena in Italy. And the, the local deposits there have a few percentage of manganese oxides, which and manganese oxides are black. Um, so this is much more of a browner color than these bright reds and yellows you can get from pure iron ochres. Um, and umber contains significant about, uh, amounts of manganese oxide. And again, I'll come back to umbers as these form in a very specific geological environment. And then finally, the name wad, really unusual name. Um, I think it's an old British mining term. Um, these are black earths, which are manganese oxide rich earths. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the slide is a little bit washed out. These soils are absolutely bright red. Um, if you're standing in this landscape, this is on the island of Antikythera in Greece. Um, Antikythera is a good place to go to see these kind of soils, which are called terra rossas. Um, which form on top of limestones, but in most places, in an in a Mediterranean climate, but in most places they're gone because of agriculture and building. So they're very, very rare soil profiles these days. But Antikythera um, is about, I don't know, 60 square kilometres, something like that. And um, there are less than 40 people living on this island and not all of them year round. So, you know, it's pretty much an uninhabited island and you've got vast tracts of these iron oxide rich soils, which are rich in hematite. And actually, I wish you could see the screen. Just imagine these as really, really bright red colored soils are quite astonishing with the blue sea, um, blue sea in the background. Um, and these are formed over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. That's why they, they've gone now. They're soils that for, take tens of thousands of years in some cases to form. Um, and the iron oxide is very finely disseminated through lime, limestones, which look to all intents and purposes gray or white. Um, but as the limestone is gradually dissolved over time, Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, as the limestone is uh, dissolved over time, then um, the iron isn't dissolved because, as we remember, pigments don't dissolve in water. And basically, you get pure red hematite iron oxide. And thank you for uh, showing the screen to, to everybody. So this is a place where, you know, if you were in a, living in a Paleolithic or Neolithic community, you could easily have got red earths. They would have been much more available than they are now and much more obvious in the landscape than they are now. 
This is Roussillon in France, and this is, again, much more brightly coloured landscape than we're seeing here, again, for the audience. Um, and you can go on this path, Le, Le Sentier des Ocres in, uh, in Roussillon, through the old ochre mines, which have been mined for pigment for um, hundreds of years. And you can see in this image that all, these are the people on the path and there were cliffs of red ochre above them. But hopefully on this side, you can see the top of this cliff is, is red or, or brown on the slide, going into this yellow ochre below. And it was only the yellow ochre that was mined and used. And the reason is that if you want to paint, to paint your barn, for example, or your walls, or indeed a painting, you want consistency. When you go to your colourman, you want to be able to buy a tube of paint or a bag of pigment or a tin of paint. And when you've used it up, you want to go back and get that same paint and get a seamless transition between the last use. Um, and you can't get that easily with natural mineral pigments. But the thing about ochres is if you heat yellow ochre to temperatures of about 250 degrees C, quite low temperatures, it converts to red ochre. And you can, if you can control that temperature, you can control exactly the shade of color you get from yellow through dark yellow into oranges to reds. And then if you take it, um, higher, you get purple colours and you, finally you'll get black at about 550 degrees C. You will reduce your hematite to magnetite black iron oxide. So if you're set up with temperature controlled kilns, then you can replicate those shades over and over again, but you can't do that with a red ochre. They probably did sell red ochre as balm paint where it didn't matter, but if you were um, Cezanne, you would buy, you know, proper yellow Roussillon ochre heated to a certain temperature to maintain a predictable and repeatable color. So here is some uh, um, hematite, um, paint that I made actually for mineral hematite. There's some samples of this in the ex exhibition downstairs. Again, thank you for showing the, uh, the true color, much more cherry red than we're seeing here. It looks quite brown and dull, um, but these are really bright cherry red colors, the color of the text actually. Um, and this is made from grinding up kidney ore, which is pure uh, specular iron oxide of hematite. Um, and it's called kidney ore because it looks a bit like a kidney when you get it in a hand specimen. So this is a pure hematite paint that I made myself just by grinding it in a pestle and mortar. Uh, and then in this case, mixing it with gum arabic to um, produce uh, a watercolour type paint. And again, bright red. <laughs> this is uh, Clearwell Caves in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire. Uh, and I was very lucky to go down there with my friend Henrietta Simpson and some other people um, to, to actually visit. You, if you go to Clearwell Cave, which I very much recommend, you can buy beautiful oak pigments um, off them there as well in their gift shop, but you just see the show caves, which are good. Uh, but we got taken down into the real oak mines, which was fantastic. And it was just this world of red. It was like being in some kind of weird womb-like environment. Um, and we were all given these orange um, suits to wear as well. So it was a strange world of red and orange and yellow. And there is quite a lot of natural variation in the ochres um, at Clearwell from these red ochres through to yellow ochres and there are naturally occurring purple ochres there as well. And actually Clearwell has been a really important site for the analysis of color in the iron oxide minerals, because, you know, as I said earlier, you can burn yellow ochre to get red, but here we've got natural yellow and red and indeed purple ochres forming. And um, one of the main controls on color is particle size. And again, I'm talking tiny, tiny particle size, you know, so from two or three microns up to about five or six microns, and that variation can affect the color in these in these ochres. So, you know, but, you know, I can't stress how difficult it is, it is to work on such tiny, tiny particles. 
So yellow ochres, um, again, this is a British source. So Clearwell, should say, um, was a really important source of ochres as pigments of all colours, um, probably from the Roman period onwards, and you can still buy their pigments today. Um, yellow ochres, uh, the best place in Britain to get them was uh, Shot Over Hill, which is just west of Oxford. And here we get uh, a series of Cretaceous sedimentary rocks called the Whitchurch Sands. And um, these were laid down in a, a in a terrestrial environment. So, you know, a lot of the rocks around Oxfordshire are full of fossils and were laid down in marine environment. But the Whitchurch, Whitchurch Sands are terrestrial. And um, there are beds of yellow iron oxide, hydroxide, the mineral goethite predominantly in them. And this, these are some um, ochres that I collected there with my um, PhD student, Anya McCausland, former PhD student, now Dr. Anya McCausland. And um, we found that we got very different grades of ochre from different horizons in this incredibly poorly exposed ochre pit. Um, so today I didn't even bother putting a picture of the ochre pit in because it just looks like a forest. This is a, a painting which is in the Ashmolean Museum of the ochre pit at the, um, in the early 19th century. And I kind of really hope that William Turner of Oxford painted this with yellow ochre that he got from Shot Over Pit. Um, but you can see there's a barrow here, there's a guy digging. We can also see some layering, some stratigraphy going on in here. And actually the BGS, British Geological Survey, have photographs of these ochre pits dating from the late 19th century. And you can see this very similar kind of layering. It looks like it's been folded. It's very irregular layering, but it hasn't um, in these ochre pits. Unfortunately, this is not what we saw. We didn't even see any cows. It was just a totally um, wooded, pit on uh, a private estate. So they're not the most rewarding of localities, but nevertheless, we did manage to get some very high quality yellow ochre from there. And this is the sort of thing that these yellow ochres, shot over ochre in the medieval and Renaissance, early Renaissance was a very well-known pigment throughout Northern Europe particularly. And it was considered to be the best pigment to use if you wanted to replicate the appearance of gold in a painting. So um, this is a very famous portrait of uh, Henry VII, the father of Henry VIII. He always strikes me as a, a much more timid looking man than his uh, robust son. And this was effectively his Tinder image. This was his, his picture that he um, sent round to the princesses of Europe in the hope that they would which way do you swipe? I don't know. <laughs> swipe left on him. Um, but he looks so no nervous, doesn't he, with his little, little fingers on the end, edge of the stage. You wouldn't have thought, oh, you'd have been saying, well, don't fancy yours much, do you, really? But anyway, he's a king. But what is important here is, you know, not only is he shown as being a, a king, um, well, he's not really shown as being a king, except for his, his Tudor rose, um, but he is wearing cloth of gold. Um, which was not uh, a garment or a fabric that was available to your, your swine herders. Um, and this is, these are images actually from the National Gallery Technical Bulletin. And um, this is a close-up of this to show it's not gold, but if you look at this painting in the National Portrait Gallery, it really does look like he's wearing a golden cloak, uh, but it is just yellow ochre. And their, their report, um, was just simply a yellow ochre of very good quality, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was, given the time and given the quality, if this was shot over ochre. So another really overlooked source of ochres are this sort of stuff that you've probably seen in streams. This is on, on Hampstead Heath in London. And um, this is the, the source, the headwaters of the River Fleet, which is a tributary of the Thames and spring lines emerge on the top of the London clay, which forms most of San Hampstead Heath, and just underneath uh, the next geological layer, which is called the Bagshot Sands. And the Bagshot Sands are iron-rich sandstones, very similar to the Whitchurch Sands that shot over. And so the, the water that comes into the headwaters of the fleet, fleet is this bright 
orange, red. And what we're getting here is a process called natural acid rock drainage. And I don't know if this is something that Karen spoke to you about because it's she's an expert on the formation of, of these deposits and I've learned a lot from her about them. So this is the breakdown of iron sulfide, iron pyrites, to form a mineral called ferrihydrite, which is another iron oxide hydroxide. And ferrihydrite over time reverts to goatite. So it starts off being orange and it becomes more yellow over over time so it's not a stable mineral in the natural environment but i you know i can't help but think and it's never ever mentioned as a pigment in anywhere any literature um yet <laughs> and, uh, but um you know it it must have been used as a pigment because it's so obvious in the landscape and you can paint with this and again i mentioned Anya mccausland uh, my former phd student who is an artist and she has made a series of paintings um, using these kind of ochres. And a lot of Anya's work, again, this is a bright red pit of water in, and black shales. This comes from a coal mine. So what we've got here on Hampstead Heath is natural acid rock drainage or NARD. Here we've got acid mine drainage where the, um, the ore minerals, the pyrite again, mainly is exposed to the atmosphere through human interaction, through mining. And, you know, often you see waters coming out of old mines that are stained red. And again, it's this mineral ferrihydrite. It's, it's completely unpoisonous. You know, it's very safe. It just doesn't look particularly pleasant. But there may be things like arsenics in there, so you should, shouldn't just drink it. Don't, don't do, yeah, don't drink it. Um, but um, yeah, so Anya's project was working actually with the coal board as well to access mines and um, their uh, filter pits and reed beds where they were storing these iron oxides. And she's used it actually to create a range of paints and to produce a number of paintings. So yeah, very available source of pigments. And as I said, yellow ochre burns very readily to form red ochre. And again, there's a series of pictures. Um, the yellow ochre was really yellow. It looks a bit dull even on this slide here. Um, and this was just a, an experimental burning we did for Camden Arts Centre in their back garden. And uh, here the fire, just a normal campfire. This was on a wet morning in November. Um, so it wasn't a hot day. And, you know, within 40 minutes, we'd convert this yellow ochre into very high quality red ochre. And actually I had a, a colleague, David Dobson, test it for me using uh, X-ray diffraction to see what kind of crystal structure we had. And he said, this is the best hematite crystal structure I've ever found, ever seen a spectra of. So, you know, even just in a very low level, low tech uh, environment, producing hematite was very easy. You can do this in your oven. Again, it, it isn't poisonous. I have done it in my oven. Don't necessarily recommend you do. I know the risks, but you, you can burn ochre in your oven. Umbers. Now, this is a really, these are really interesting um, rocks and pigments. So they're manganese rich ochres, if you like. So between five and 20% 20% manganese oxide present in them. And this is some. Uh, umber that I collected myself from a place called Magi in Cyprus, which was famous as an umber pit from, you know, the seven, well, not the 17th century, what we're saying, from the 14th century, you know, it was a, uh, a major supplier of umber to the painters of the uh, Italian Renaissance. Um, and again, umber can be burned, you can't really see the difference, this is much more chestnutty red, again, I did this in my cooker at home, um, sort of slightly greenish brown goes to this chestnut red. Sorry, you can't see it in the projection, but it produces this lovely powdery uh, material. Now, the, the other property of um, umber, when we used to take our students on a field trip to Cyprus and took them to the umber pits at Margi, we always used to have a competition, which was to see what is the biggest piece of umber, umber you can stick to your tongue. And I kid you not, and it's a very light rock and it has this property of absorbing water. It's so bizarre. You can get 
I've had, you know, a chunk of umber, which I've taken home and washed because everybody's had it stuck to their tongue. And the water goes into it, but doesn't flow over it or come out the other end. It just kind of absorbs it. It's very, very bizarre kind of rock. Um, and you can, and I think the winner was a piece of umber about this big stuck to the tongue. Um, I have a photo, but I do not have the permission of the individual yes. concerned, so I haven't uh, haven't shown it. And it would be it's not the, they're not the most flattering photos and um, stick to your tongue, but it's quite a remarkable material. But the and it's manganese that does this, and manganese is really great in oil painting because it helps because of these properties. It helps your oil dry. So you can, and cobalt has the same effect, actually. So you can buy manganese rich and cobalt rich, so-called drying oils, if you're an oil painter, to mix in with your linseed oil to help the paint dry quicker. And so, you know, um, umber in its own right is a pigment, but it's also what we, also, we call a sicative as well in terms of things that go into paint. So it's a, it's a filler that you add to a paint that helps the paint dry more quickly as well. So really interesting materials, embers. And geologically, they're really interesting. Don't worry too much about the science bit here, but embers, true embers, form only in what we call mid-ocean ridge environments in plate tectonic settings. So places like the mid-Atlantic ridge, the East Pacific rise, and they're associated with black soot smokers which are these chimney-like volcanic structures. I'm sure you've seen them on TV documentaries, but they are they look like chimneys with this black smoke belting out of them. And the smoke is rich in manganese, it's rich in iron, it's also rich in gold. Most, most embers are gold-bearing, but in relatively small amounts, and it's almost impossible to get the gold out of them. And this stuff comes out of the volcanic center into the water and is deposited around the um, what will become an ore deposit here, which is rich in things like iron and copper. And you get these umber sediments forming in troughs around this environment. Um, so they form in the deep sea floor and we get them preserved on land where we've had major mountain building episodes and, and the sea floor has been forced up abducted is the word onto the land so the place to go and look for embers is somewhere where you get what we call an ophiolite complex so places like oman and particularly cyprus and this is why cyprus became um, the main source of embers during the renaissance and actually in the background here this is Magi uh pit and we've got embers overlying, overlying um, basalt lavas but this these fig these titles refer to this section um, which is in Scuriatissa copper mine. And these here are the copper ores. And they look yellowish, and that's because there's pyrite weathering out on the, of them, but also they're quite metallic as well. So this is chalcopyrites and iron pyrite weathering out. And then we've got um, ocean floor volcanism producing pillow basalts, which are a variety of lava that you get in this environment. And then you can see the brown embers forming directly on top of them. So, you know, we're seeing this environment, you know, this is the ore, the green is the basalts and then the ochres on top. So perfect section. Green earth, right. So never, not all earths are red, yellow and brown or black indeed. Green earths are, Clay mineral um, rich earth, and it's an iron rich clay mineral, but it's what we've looked at mainly in the other slides is ferric iron oxide, and this is ferrous iron oxide, iron three plus, um, sorry, iron two plus, and um, no, iron three plus, sorry. Uh, and this is either the mineral glauconite or celadonite. And they're very difficult to tell apart, these two minerals. If you're a geologist and you're looking at these in a geological environment, glauconite only, 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 only forms in marine sediments. Uh, and celadonite normally forms from the weathering of basalts. So actually this is, was another mineral that was exported from Cyprus. And indeed this is some celadonite from Cyprus, from um, Windsor and Newton's 
archives. The picture above shows a, a microscope image of the green sand from uh, the Isle of Wight. The white is quartz and the green is the mineral glauconite. And again, you can separate, this is quite a friable sand. Uh, you can separate it out and have uh, quite easily uh, purify these green particles um, away from the, uh, the sand by levigating it because the, the quartz sand sinks and the iron oxide will float, or sorry, iron rich clay will float for a bit longer. And this is a pigment I've made from this uh, selenite sample here, which was absolutely beautiful color. And, and this was the most readily available and cheapest green that artists had. And it was particularly used for underpainting flesh tones, European flesh tones. So there are a couple of examples here. Um, this is the so-called Manchester Madonna, one of Michelangelo's unfinished paintings in the National Gallery of London. And you can see that the two figures in the back haven't been finished, but the areas of flesh have been marked out using green earth. Now, if you're a bit like me and you have a couple of glasses of wine of an evening and you get a bit flushed, ladies may know this, you can buy green face powder to make you look more normal after a few. And um, this used to be, this, this makeup, this cosmetic was also made of green earth and it makes European flesh look more of a normal colour. Um, so if you were just painting with, you know, pink, everybody would look really pink and weird. I'm sure you did this at school, didn't you? When you did painting, you paint somebody and you think, oh, we're pink, I'll color, I'll color that picture of my mum in pink. And it didn't look anything like your mum. Um, so, but you can rectify this effect if you know what you're doing. And Michelangelo properly knew what he was doing about painting by using green underneath and then painting the pink flesh tones on top. And it brings, it, it brings that pinkness down and changes it. Now, this can go horribly wrong. So this gentleman over here looks, looks rather unwell. And he's got a completely green face. And, um, and this is because he, again, in the same technique, his skin was painted in uh, green earth. And then they painted in the flesh tones using a, a, a dye pigment called carmine. And carmine hasn't lasted the 500 or so years since this painting was last painted and has faded away, leaving him regretting that he's gone into the afterlife wearing that red hat. <laughs> you can tell on his face, can't you? Now, blue earths are my, my absolute favorite pigments and these are very not well-known uh, ochres. Um, and it's the mineral vivianite, which is a phosphate. And I want to thank my friend Scott Sutton. He lives um, in the middle of the no of nowhere in the in the Midwest, and he goes and collects these vivianite nodules from marine clays. And they are marine clays that once eroded a a, a forest fifty million years or so. Well, no, actually, probably not that long ago, few few million years ago. And these, believe it or not are fossilized pine cones that have been replaced by this mineral vivianite. And it really is that blue. So actually for once, the blues are really well projected on this screen, which is good for the rest of the talk actually. Um, and it's just a stun stunningly blue pigment. Now um, you tend to see vivianite used in paintings in ethnographic settings. So actually this is some um, under the microscope. And again, these particles are about 40 microns long, but you can see the strong blue color even at that particle size and under the microscope. Um, and these come from Papua New Guinea and they were collected by a colleague called Rowena Hill, who was studying the use of um, Vivianite as a body paint in um, the local tribes that live in that area. And we also know that these, that North American Vivianite was used in uh, indigenous painting. 
Um, in Europe, we don't see it that much. It, it allegedly turns up in Russian icon painting in about the 12th century. And it has been recorded from, again, similar age, medieval 12th, 13th century chapels in the Pyrenees. But again, I think it's one of these pigments that people don't really know about, so they haven't looked for. So it's something that I think we'll see more of. Um, and here's some images just to show these are um, objects in the Museum of Anthropology in the University of British Columbia. So carved wooden, um, these are kind of, they look a bit like canoes, but with animal heads, but they were used for storing big piles of cake and food for parties, for pot latches. Um, you, that's what you want, isn't it? A big seal full of cake, brilliant. <laughs> and this is just a close up of the eye and this blue gray, very, very typical of the color of Vivianite. It's a kind of very subtle blue gray. Uh, and these are this is a detail of a painting by my, my colleague, Joe Volley at the Slay School of Fine Art called Among the Colors, where she's used various um, pure pigments, including this stripe here, which is Vivianite pigment. So a rare contemporary use of this pigment by an artist. Now, the main technique that I use for studying pigments is microscopy and particularly polarizing light microscopy. And um, it's really useful because microscopy makes small things look big. And that's what you need when you've got really, really tiny particles. And you can see all sorts of things in there that you can't see with the naked eye. And biominerals are really important. So this is chalk. Good old White Cliffs of Dover style chalk from the UK. And when you look at it under the microscope, you can see it's formed of all these little circular particles, always difficult to take photos of, but you can see they look a bit like pinwheels. You can see there's a cross in them, particularly in that one there, and to a certain extent in this one here. And it's a, a kind of marine algae, phytoplankton, called what's an area barnsii. And what's an area of is all over the chalk. And that's what chalk is made out of. It's made out of these really fine fossils of marine phytoplankton. And it's very pure. These are made out of calcium carbonate. Everything you see is calcium carbonate and there's nothing else in the chalk. So you'd think it'd be really attractive as a pigment. And it was, except for the fact it gives you a really transparent white. So if you wanted to paint a veil, on a bride or some lace or something, chalk's fine, but it doesn't give you a really strong white. And actually strong white pigments have always been a bit of a problem uh, for artists to lay their hands on. Uh, there are not many mineral pigments that produce good strong whites uh, and the chalk isn't one of them. Um, but chalk was used a lot as a filler and it was also used for making lake pigments with dyes. Um, and it's something that does turn up a lot. And the presence of these cockliths make it possible to identify it under the microscope. But yeah, here's the chalk on um, the Isle of Wight and the needles. And as you can see, the gray lines are flints, but you can, you know, you've got a pure white material here. Something that looks very similar in hand specimen is diatomaceous earth. Um, again, this produces a very pure white pigment, albeit a rather transparent one. And it's also made out of biominerals, but instead of being calcium carbonate, it's made out of silica. And diatomaceous earth, <coughs> excuse me, is made out of diatoms, which are silicious tests. So I don't really know what diatom, I don't know what they do all day. I don't, I don't think they're animals. Jane, do you know? Algae, thank you. Well, this is a picture of some diatoms in life position. And um, yeah, they're algae. I remember a friend, a colleague of mine and a friend, Elspeth Erker, who, who worked on diatoms. When I said to her, what are diatoms? She said, you know, when you're on the train and you're coming out of a tunnel and there's green slime on the walls, that's diatoms. So it's like, right, okay. So once all the green slime has decayed away, you're left with these beautiful little glass, effectively, tiny, tiny particles. Um, and this is what you see as a pigment. And when you see this stuff in outcrop and it forms a lot in things like volca volcanic lakes and things like that, you know, it's this pure white material like that chunk I have there. Um, 
And again, you see this stuff in, in pigments as fillers. It was used a lot in Pompeii, in Roman painting, in Pompeii as a filler, and they were getting this from the volcanic um, lakes in the Campus Legre and probably you know, around Vesuvius as well. So very readily available material, but not an opaque white. Um, opaque whites really didn't come along until the discovery that you can make lead white by soaking um, sheets of lead um, or exposing them to vinegar fumes with a bit of horse manure just to raise the temperature of it. Um, I'll tell you what, the number of pig you know, synthetic pigments, the number of pigments that you can make in a shed with some vinegar and some horse manure, quite astonishing. Or urine, but anyway, that's another talk as well. Um, but manganese oxides would give you black pigments. Now, I don't want to overstate the importance of manganese blacks because the police are coming for me. By far and away, the most commonly encountered blacks that you find in painting are charcoal type or soot based carbon blacks. And that is true for Paleolithic painting as well. However, we have found a lot of manganese oxide block blacks in the cave paintings of Southern France. Now, it's really interesting as a geologist because if you said to me, and I, I'm a good geologist, I'm a good field geologist, I've seen a lot of rocks, I understand pigment deposits. If you said to me, right, take me out and show me a manganese oxide rich earth, I'd really struggle to find one. I might take you to Milos in Greece, but in France, I don't know where, I don't know, I wouldn't know where to start looking, but people did find these and there is some evidence of them occurring in the Massey Central region. Um, but you see them used in, um, in painting. Now I'm not gonna tell you what we call this stuff in terms of modern paints, cause it's just the most awful stuff to work with, manganese oxide black, mineral black, it's sold as. Um, and remember what I was telling you about umber and it's the manganese and umber which makes it dry. Well, imagine that a hundred times <laughs> magnified. And this is just like thick, totally unmanipulative paint that is really hard to shift around with a brush. Um, yeah, awful stuff to work with. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, we do see it used along with charcoal in these cave paintings. Uh, very fine grained wad, which is the, the equivalent of that. Um, um, well, it is a manganese oxide ochre. Uh, and this is um, manganite, manganese oxide black and manganese phosphate purple, which is often found with it, which would work as a purple pigment in its own right, incidentally, but it's never been identified, unfortunately. I've made some manganese phosphate purple, um, but yeah, I don't know any historical occur occurrences of it. But yeah, black, black minerals under the microscope are not the most rewarding because you can't tell what they are. They all look the same. Um, there are many other black pigments. Magnetite has been used as a pigment, um, but there are a number of geological carbon blacks. Um, this is uh, graphite under the microscope, it's just transparent. These sheets are just transparent. Very difficult to see in a photograph. Um, and there is a kind of metamorphosed rock called ampelite, which is kind of a metamorphosed coal. It's not coal, it's a green sheets, fast sheets metamorphism. Uh, and it comes from the uh, Ile de Crozon on, in Brittany. And, um, and it's generally known in, in French painting circles as Pierre Noir. And I, I bought some in um, kind of a top end artist supply shop in Paris. And the guy was kept telling me that this is a pied noir votable, the real thing. And I would say, but what is it? And I said, oh, it's the real thing. It's the real thing. And I was like, but what is it? He says, this is black stone and it's the real thing. And so we had this conversation about, qu'est-ce que c'est le pied noir véritable? Ah oui, mais c'est le véritable pied noir véritable. On and on. Anyway, I didn't find, I, it was later I found out that it's this material called ampelite. Uh, and there's also very similar material that's found in Russia called shungite, which is very widely used in uh, Russian icon painting traditions as well. Which brings me on to coals. Um, 
just a little reminder of what happens with coal. Coals form from um, the diagenetic, so low temperature change of terrestrial plant related stuff, as opposed to oil that form from the maturation of marine algae, like coccoliths, for example. So coals form from peat box, basically. And as you successfully bury it and increase the temperature over geological time, you'll go from peat to a material called lignite, which is brown. And then there's a major chemical change called, uh, easy to remember, and diagenetic gelification step. And then you start to produce coals as we know them, which are dense, lustrous, hard materials, vitronites, as opposed to lignite and peat, which are what we call porous humanites, which, which are soft brown and dull. And it's, um, it is the lignite type things that have been mainly used as um, pigments, despite you know the obvious attractions of coal as a black pigment, it's not been used that often. Uh, and there are a number, this is, this is what lignite looks like under the microscope. Um, various varieties, and these are, you know, trade names, Van Dyke Brown, not named after the famous painter Van Dyke, named after some other bloke, um, also called Van Dyke. Castle Earth, which is um, a, a humic earth that was found in uh, the Republic of, sorry, of Kappa Brown, sh I should say, was found in the Republic of Ireland, and Castle Earth was found in, in central Germany. Um, but these were very popular pigments, nice brown. They were beautiful in oils because coal is quite oily in its own right. So they perform really well in oil paintings. And um, even though not named after Van Dyck the painter, it was the sort of pigment he used a lot. And also artists like Joshua Reynolds, they just loved these pictures. Uh, so we love using these pigments in their pictures. The problem is that they haven't really stayed the test of time and everything's going a bit south on um, particularly um, Reynolds paintings because he made all these concoctions using weird oils and everything and they never dried back to what I said before and everything is kind of sliding off the painting um, but yes they were very 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 popular pigments in the 17th and early 18th century paintings Think of all those gentlemen out hunting wearing brown leather coats, all painted with these humic earth type pigments. There are a few coals that are used. Um, this is Biddeford, um, so called Biddeford Black, which uh, outcrops in this thin vein um, in Greencliff, Greencliff Bay, um, in Biddeford in North Devon. And this was mined as coal, but it was also mined for pigment and still is used as a pigment on occasion, and uh, very fine, soft coal uh, under the microscope. Um, lots I've never actually seen this used in a painting, but there are lots of reports of recommending it in um, 16th, 17th, 16th century painting manuals, um, particularly for painting miniatures. A very famous miniature artist called Nicholas Hilliard, um, wrote a manual on painting materials and he recommends Biddeford Black as the perfect black for uh, miniature painting and presumably because of its very, very fine grain size, which you can see here, this is at 400 times magnification. So the smallest particle, well, the largest particles you can see here are about 10 microns across. And this is uh, another image from the uh, National Gallery Technical Bulletin. Whoops, this chap. Um, doesn't look happy, does he? And it is another warts and all uh, picture, but lots of, lots of use of black hair. And um, the analysts, uh, Marika Spring and her colleagues, oops, sorry, wrong button again, did find a considerable amount of coal. These black is coal, and this is ultramarine blue, which is used in his coat, but the background is pretty much shiny black coal, which, and it's quite an unusual thing to see in a painting. But then again, that is quite an unusual painting as well. Um, asphalt is also used. Asphalt is a solid form of naturally occurring bitumen um, that is solid until about 110 degrees C when it starts to melt, so you can grind it. And uh, it's, it's quite distinctive under the microscope if you use UV light, 
because you get these what I call comet trails coming out of it or fluorescent hydrocarbons that are part of uh, its structure. Otherwise, it's brown in colour, looks exactly like the human humic earth. But it has been used as a pigment since the Neolithic. A uh, number of um, pottery um, fragments have been found in um, the Near East, painted black with bitumen. I found it on um, Bronze Age Egyptian artifacts, model boat, in fact, where it was used to paint the, the base of the boat, which would in real life have been coked with bitumen to make it waterproof. Um, and it has been used as a modern pigment in very much the way that um, Van Dyke Brown and Castle Brown have been used. Um, because most of it came historically from the, the Near East, it's often sold as bitumen of Judea. Um, sometimes sold as Gilsonite. American sources tend to be called Gils Gilsonite. So finally, let's end with the classics. Um, really brightly coloured mineral pigments. This is uh, a mineral called Vaseliite. The darker blue that you can see on this fragment and the paler blue is a mineral called hemimorphite. Um, and Vaselia, I'm just going to mention here because it's, you know, one of the newest finds. Most of these pigments we've known about for the last 3,000 plus years, but actually Vaselia has only been recently discovered as a mineral used in um, pre-Columbian painting in South America. So a new mineral pigment, these things don't turn up very often. But the classics are things like the arsenic sulfides, orpiment realgar and pararealgar, which are orange and yellow pigments. Um, these are incredibly poisonous materials. So this is a, a place called um, Boca Grande in the Campo Flegre in uh, Pozzuoli in the Bay of Naples. And these are volcanic fumaroles. And these pyramids have been piled up by the local park wardens I'm going to call them part wardens. Nutters is probably a better word for them. And they pile these stones up. And I was chatting to these blokes who were sitting around having a smoke next to these fumaroles as if it wasn't bad enough what they were breathing in. And, and they told me that they pile the stones up and they leave them over the vent for about two weeks and they go a nice colour and then they give them to the kids as a present. So I said, can I have one? And they're like, yeah, if you want, yeah. So they gave me one, but... Yeah, so, you know, it's pure arsenic sulfide, incredibly poisonous. Um, but you do see this used in um, in Roman painting in Pompeii, you know, and yeah, just 10 miles away. Um, so, you know, probably exactly where they got it from. Uh, you see it a lot in Egyptian painting as well. And I actually, my pet theory is that the curse of the pharaohs is all about breathing in arsenic sulfides because the Egyptians specifically use orpiment. It's called orpiment for a reason, golden pigment in Latin, ori pigmentum. Um, they believed that the gods had skin of gold and orpiment was used to paint the skin of the gods. So if you go into these tombs that have been shut for 2,000, 4,000 years, and you're the first person to go in. And orpiment sublimes, you know, you're in a desert, it can be warm, although tombs do have a relatively constant temperature, but nevertheless, the places are full of arsenic gas and you're the first person in. And um, yeah, so I'm not surprised all these early Egyptian explorers got ill. This is a crust of um, Orpiment and Rialga forming in uh, New Zealand, in Waiotapu, one of the volcano geothermal areas there. And again, you know, this is forming within, you know, weeks, months, years, um, you know, and it's the sort of thing that if you didn't know better, um, you could easily scrape off and make a nice pigment from. Now, the thing about Rialga, which is orange, this is a picture of Orpiment and Rialga, they're often formed together. This is a mineral specimen. This is the orpiment, bright yellow, the realgar is red, and realgar reacts to light and goes yellow. And so this is this mineral specimen when I first bought it. And this is the same specimen, slightly different angle, but the best I could do uh, a few years later. And you can see how it's changed. And this also happens quite a lot in the painting environment and, the, and there are many paintings that have been ruined because of this. Um, you see Rialgar a lot on Egyptian scroll painting, 
this, these orange hieroglyphics are painted in Realgar and it's been preserved absolutely pristine because these have been rolled up and been in a tomb for 4,000 years. So they've not been exposed to light. So it has preserved. Um, and this, this painting uh, or detail of a painting by Lorenzo Lotti in the National Gallery, a uh, lady with the drawing of Lucretia, um, the orange stripes on her very Venetian Renaissance dress also contain Realgar, again, according to my, my colleagues at the uh, National Gallery who've analysed it. But, but for some reason, this is not altered. Just the look of the draw. Another poisonous pink, right, all of these are poisonous from now on, pretty much. Um, you know, there was um, a, a, a Renaissance artist called Cinino Cinini. He wasn't particularly good artist, so if you've not heard of him, don't worry. But what he is famous for is writing a manual on painting. And he tells you all sorts of things like how to paint a corpse, uh, how to paint gemstones, for example. How to, my favourite is how, how to cast your own body. Ask me about that later. Uh, but he also talks about the pigments and he talks about orpiment and says, you know, this is the most beautiful yellow pigment you can ever dream of. It's absolutely perfect. You know, it, it's lovely. And then he kind of in capital says, but don't use it because you will die. You know, so people knew at the time that these were not good. Cinnabar, just as bad. In use um, since the, the Neolithic, at least. Uh, really important pigment in um, Chinese and Japanese, well, East Asian painting. See this gentleman in his pillar box red uh, coat. This is a part of the Chinese ink stick where you've got black, um, carbon black ink mixed in with red cinnabar ink. These are the Chimli sisters who were not only twins, but both had children on the same day, allegedly. Uh, and you can see the, the, uh, the robes are red and again painted with cinnabar. This painting's in the um, Tate Gallery in London. And this is mineral cinnabar, beautiful red uh, mineral, which again grinds up and retains its color. When it finally ground, as you can see in these images, these are prepared pigments of cinnabar in plain polarized light and under cross polarized light. And this is cinnabar in a rock sample from the main sources of uh, Almaden in Spain. And this is um, cinnabar or at Almaden. Now the mercury bleeds out of this rock. You can get native mercury and actually all these little silver speckles that you can see on this image is native mer mercury, which is literally bleeding out of this rock, which I keep in a sealed glass jar that I never open. But as time goes on, there's more and more beads of mercury accumulating uh, around the bottom of the jar. But this bright red, again, you'll be able to see it. Thank you very much for holding up the, the picture. Very bright red colour, again, more similar to the colour of the writing than the brownish shade you're seeing on the image. Um, earliest use of cinnabar, incredibly early use of a mineral pigment actually is at Chattel Hoyek. Um, which is the site I've worked on in central Turkey with a, another one of my former students, Diyu Jamakorlu. And uh, here we find um, shells. This is an oil, uh, sorry, a mussel shell, freshwater mussel shell with traces of cinnabar pigment left in it, handprints and, and red painting on wall. And this is nearly 10,000 years ago. So incredibly ancient. PPMB means pre-pottery Neolithic B, as opposed to pre-pottery Neolithic A. So, you know, this is before agriculture, it's before uh, pottery, but people were living in a town at the time and they were using cinnabar pigment, which could be sourced from a nearby volcano. Then there's the basic copper carbonates, azurite and malachite. Uh, green azurite, blue, sorry, blue azurite, green malachite. You've got some lovely examples downstairs. And these are pigments that I've made from these minerals. So pure azurite, pure malachite, and a mixture of the two. I think these are my favorites. Sorry, I should stay here. I think these are my favourite pigments. 
really, really beautiful colours. Um, and again, very soft, very easy to make. Now, if you grind these too fine, you will lose the colour. So there's a bit of skill in grinding at Malachi and Azure. And this is something I read about a lot. And then when I actually started making pigments myself from first, pro, uh, first principles, you get, when you're there with your pestle and mortar, you see, you get your eye in for this colour change, which I can't really describe, but you know, and you feel like you're a real craftsman when you feel that change in the colour, and that's when you have to stop, because if you go any further, it goes white, it goes too pale. Um, very, very distinctive minerals under the microscope, azurite and malachite, they're very bright, both in dark field and light field. And um, used again in the in the Far East. This is a Japanese scroll painting with this incredible azurite blue used for this iris. And this is the background uh, blue as well in this painting by Holbein of a lady with a squirrel again in the, the uh, National Gallery. I do recommend go and look at pictures. Don't just look at the pictures, look at the colors. You really get your eye in for the difference. And I'll, I will talk briefly, because I have to, about ultramarine at the end of this talk. And it's, it's a different blue. This is a much more greeny blue. Holbein used blues as a background for many of his portraits. And you can really get your eye in for when he used azurite, azurite and when he obviously could afford or, or the sitter was prepared to pay for the use of ultramarine. And they're both beautiful blues. This is much more greeny blue, whereas ultramarine is a much more purpley blue. Now, as I say, you know, these, these minerals need to be... That's okay, I'm nearly finished, thank you. Uh, this is um, malachite in a macro image, and you can see how coarse it is. It forms this cliff, as opposed to the very fine-grained black carbon black here. And again, uh, a picture by a friend, uh, Jumana Medlej, who is a, a, a um, calligrapher and Islamic artist, and uh, she's used a lot of Malachi and Azurite in this piece. And then, you know, one of the few opaque whites, this is a really rare mineral, uh, it's called Huntite. In fact, I've seen more of it in paintings than I have actually as a geologist. Um, and it's a form of dolomite, but it does give you this very opaque white, and it's been used for this dog um, here in the uh, Fitzwilliam Museum, Book of the Dead. Right, lapis lazuli, this is my last pigment. I never talk about lapis lazuli because it is such old hat that I thought I can't really give a talk about mineral pigments without including it. So lapis lazuli is the rock from which the pigment, sorry, ultramarine is extracted. And there's some examples here, some large crystals, of pure lazurite, but this is what it, the rock normally looks like, a banded marble, it's a marble. The white is calcite and dolomite, pyrite is often there, and blue ultramarine. Uh, the main source by far and away is um, the mines at Sarasang in Northeast Afghanistan in Badakhshan province. Uh, but there, these are other important historical areas, but probably pigment was not produced from these areas until the 20th century. And yes, yeah, some pictures, again, another piece of ultramarine. This is what it looks like under the microscope. Again, this very strong blue of the mineral lazurite. This is an exception. This mineral is a silicate, and it's much harder and much more difficult to process and extract than any of the other minerals that I've shown you. But it has, it breaks all the rules because it has this very strong body color and this beautiful color. Everybody loves blue and always has been. And as a result of that, it was the most valuable pigment, second only to cinnabar, but the most valuable pigment in the Renaissance. We first see lapis lazuli, by which I mean the natural ultramarine as opposed to synthetic ultramarine used in about the 12th century in Europe. And a um, couple of hundred years later, we can see it being used here as on the Wilton diptych and the Virgin Mary is often depicted in ultramarine, not because she wore blue in first century Judea, but because whoever commissioned this wanted to show their wealth by saying I can afford this pigment. 
And this is what it looks like under the microscope, blue particles, pyrite, and also carbonate in there as well. And this is how you tell natural ultramarine from synthetic ultramarine. And this is my final slide. And this is another painting by Michelangelo in the National Gallery called The Entombment. Uh, and Christ is being removed from the cross. And this figure here was probably Mary weeping over the death of her son, but it seems they couldn't afford the paint. And so she was never painted in. It's strange that everybody else is more than truly sketched in. She so looks like she's looking at her phone, doesn't she? But yeah, Mary here never got painted, presumably because whoever commissioned this painting ran out of money. Although he's got a bit of ultramarine in the sky there. So apologies if I've overrun, and there are many, many pigments that I've left out, but thank you very much, and that is the end. Well, I think she's shown us uh, what a big subject this is, but you've given us a wonderful introduction, and you've transmitted to us an enthusiasm for the subject. So thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, everybody.